So we start this course by talking about atmospheric chemistry and the chemical reactions and processes that occur in the troposphere and the stratosphere. So for chapters one and two, we'll focus primarily on stratospheric chemistry and talk about ozone uh, particularly. And then in chapters three and four, we'll move more into tropospheric chemistry. So before we even discuss those reactions or begin to discuss those reactions, we really need to talk about the composition of the atmosphere itself and, uh, and what we mean when we talk about the stratosphere or the troposphere. What are those? Those aren't maybe familiar terms to us on an everyday basis. But when we first start talking about the atmosphere and atmospheric composition, good just to start with a basic uh, atmospheric composition or the composition of unpolluted dry air. And we specify here that it's dry air, so not containing any water or vapor, even though most of the atmosphere or most of the troposphere and uh, some, some of the stratosphere it contains some water, that water is, uh, content is very variable, as you can note, uh, just on the difference between sunny days versus rainy days, the amount of water in the, uh, in the air is very variable. But for dry air, the remaining composition is not generally very variable. So it's normally about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. There's approximately 1% argon, and then there's, um, about 0.04% CO2. Uh, and of course, you can see that these numbers are a little bit approximate. There are more specific values we can find, but um, all of this adds up roughly to 100%. And it's important to note that when we're talking about percentages here, we're talking about mole percent, which is simply uh, basically a molecule, number of molecules percentage or a volume percent, uh, so the amount of uh, volume occupied by that gas. And it's important to note that using the ideal gas law, mole percent and volume percent are uh, essentially equivalent because moles and volume are directly proportional to each other in the ideal gas law. It is important to make this distinction because often percentage is used for mass and in other chemical applications. And here, we would just want to specify this as a mole or volume percent. Now, in addition to these four gases, there are many, many, many trace gases in the atmosphere, methane, carbon monoxide, that formaldehyde here, even hydroxyl radical we'll talk about quite a bit. NOx, uh, that simply stands as a placeholder for a, a large number of um, nitrogen oxides, uh, nitrogen and oxygen combined to form a variety of different compounds. Uh, SO2 sulfur dioxide, as well as there's other, uh, we could probably put SOx as well, because there's other uh, sulfur oxygen compounds and then ammonia. Uh, and this is just a, a small sampling of the uh, atmospheric gases that are out there. So we've mentioned stratosphere and troposphere, but what what exactly are those terms? So let's look at a, a graph here briefly. In blue, I have the air pressure. And so you'll notice that at uh, zero altitude, so altitude is on the y-axis and air pressure on the bottom here is on the x-axis in blue, whereas temperature uh, is also on the x-axis but in green. So if we look primarily just at the air pressure at zero altitude, so at sea level, my uh, air pressure is about one atmosphere. That's, that's standard conditions. But as we increase in altitude up through the atmosphere, and the y-axis is in kilometers here, so 1,000 meters at a time, as we increase, you'll notice that the air pressure begins to drop off dramatically. And so by the time we get to about 30, kilometers up, our air pressure is now significantly below 0.1 atmospheres. So we're uh, probably down around 0 0.01, maybe about 1% of the air pressure at, uh, at sea level. Additionally, some interesting things happen with the temperature in the atmosphere. So initially, if we're at sea level, then the temperature 
here is just listed as being approximately 15 or so degrees Celsius, somewhere between 15 and 20. And of course that can vary and varies also depending on you know, weather conditions. But then as we start to increase up through the atmosphere, the temperature drops off dramatically. So down to all the way about negative 56 degrees Celsius at about 15 kilometers up. But then there's an inversion where as we increase up through the atmosphere a bit more, the temperature actually begins to go back up again. And it's at this first inversion point that we get to the, um, I guess, the transition between the troposphere and the stratosphere. So at that temperature inversion, the atmospheric region below that is known as the troposphere. And this is where the majority of all of the atmospheric chemistry that we are uh, normally familiar with in terms of rain or clouds, uh, most of that, uh, a lot of that occurs in the troposphere and, and then all kind of ground level pollution, that's all tropospheric chemistry we'll get to in chapters three and four. But then after this temperature inversion, the temperature begins to go back up until we hit a new temperature inversion at about 50 kilometers where then the temperature drops back off again. And the region in between these two temperature inversions is known as the stratosphere. Now, if we think about uh, in the ideal gas law, that pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles and thus the number of molecules, we can see that even at, uh, well, we, we can see that the majority of air molecules exist in the troposphere because the air pressure has already dropped down to about 0.1% or not 0.1% but 0.1 atmospheres approximately at the barrier between the troposphere and the stratosphere. And then above that in the stratosphere we drop essentially all the way off uh, to much less than 0.1, much less probably than 0.01 atmospheres in, uh, by the time we reach the top of the stratosphere. And so from all of this, we can say that greater than 99% of all the atmospheric mass directly related to the number of molecules uh, by, the, by the individual molar masses, that greater than 99% of all of the mass in the atmosphere exists in the troposphere and the stratosphere. So above the stratosphere, there's also the mesosphere and then exosphere and uh, some other uh, regions as well. But for this class, we don't really care about those because we're interested in molecular chemistry and you need to have generally molecules there to do that. And since the vast majority of all of those molecules exist in uh, the troposphere and the stratosphere, those are primarily our regions of interest for atmospheric chemistry. Now we've talked a bit about the uh, we've talked a bit about the ideal gas law during this time, and it might be helpful to go through a quick problem, refreshing our skills of using the ideal gas law. You may even need to remember what exactly is the ideal gas law. So let's just take a problem here and work through it. So let's assuming that we have the normal composition of air, which on the previous page we said 78% nitrogen. 21% oxygen, et cetera. Calculate the number of oxygen molecules, so not the number of moles, but the number of individual molecules contained in one cubic centimeter of atmosphere at an altitude of 15 kilometers, which is approximately the interface between the troposphere and the stratosphere. The air pressure at this altitude is approximately 0.114 atmospheres, and the average temperature is quite cold, negative 56.5 degrees Celsius. And we are asked for the number of molecules. But first, let's write the ideal gas law and then rearrange it to, find, uh, to, to help us find what we're looking for. So remember that the ideal gas law is pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times the gas constant times temperature, and it's the absolute temperature in Kelvin. Well, we are asked for the number of oxygen molecules. Molecules is directly proportional to the number of moles, and so what we are looking for really in the ideal gas law is N. And we have pressure, 
and we have volume and we have temperature. So we simply rearrange to solve for N. So in this case, we have to make a few adjustments though. We don't have a gas constant uh, that uses volume in terms of cubic centimeters. We're more familiar with the gas constants that involve volume in liters. And so we take our one cubic centimeter and we can convert that to liters. Remembering that one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter, and that there's a thousand milliliters in a liter, so we come out with 0 0.001 liters. Additionally, we've got to take the temperature and convert that to an absolute scale. So we have Celsius plus 273.15 to get us to Kelvin. We end up with 216.7 Kelvin. And then we have now our volume in the right units, atmos uh, pressures in the right units, uh, temperatures in the right units. We can simply plug everything in and we'll come out with 6.411 times 10 to the minus six moles of air. Now at this point we have to remember though that what we're talking about, what we're looking for is number of oxygen molecules, not just the total number of molecules in the air that's in that sample. We want just the oxygen. And remember, that's where this normal composition comes in, because we remember that air is 21 mole percent oxygen. And so I simply take my 6.411 times 10 to the minus six moles and multiply that by 21% uh, or 0.21, and that gets me the number of moles of O2. So 1.346 times 10 to the minus six moles of O2. But I haven't been asked for moles of O2, I've been asked for a number of molecules. Reach way back into general chemistry and remember that the relationship between moles and molecules, really the definition of a mole, is using Avogadro's number, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So now that I have this relationship between moles and molecules, I can take the number of moles, multiply it by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole, and I come out with 8.107 times 10 to the 17th molecules of O2 are contained in a single cubic centimeter at an altitude of 15 kilometers. Hopefully that's a good refresher on the use of the ideal gas law.